Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Two Peas in a Podcast. My name is Michelle Rawls, and I am joined with Dina Spencer. Uh, again, we are back. Thank you for joining us. If you could do us a huge favor and make sure you hit that subscribe button, we would be so pleased. Today's podcast is Plant Now and Forever Hold Your Peas, Planting <laughs> Seeds of Growth for You and Your Community. So, guys, today we're going to tap on a couple of items for you. So, like the benefits of why gardening, GMO to non GMO and organic food industries, the mm -hmm. current political climate, and different oh. ways to garden. So yes. Dina is going to tap on a ton of stuff today. Cannot wait. Let's get started. So I wanted to do a brief overview just really quickly. So in the very beginning, now this, guys, this dates back to George Washington, right? <laughs> so <laughs> in the beginning, George Washington actually started this whole process of farm to table. That is what he wanted. Whenever it came up to the Revolutionary War, he wanted his apple trees to come up from his trees to the table. That's what this was all about. Now, guys, this goes even further. Uh, this goes into John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. They continued forward. But let me tell you where this really changed. This changed with President Lincoln. So Lincoln, we know, was a farmer, right? Mm -hmm. He farmed. He was where he was from. He's from Indiana and he farmed. He was uh, into so, wineries as well, just an exactly. FYI. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That is so right. Um, so President Lincoln wanted everyone to come together. You know how we have these community fairs? So as we have these community fairs, his whole idea was is that you would bring your farm to the table. So when you brought it to the farm, then you turned around and you had an opportunity to bring it then to your table at that point. That is when he came about with the USDA. So that's how the USDA mm. got formed. Um, and then come to find out, at that point, let's take a look at this too. When Lincoln was in office, over half of the United States was farm, right? It was all mm -hmm. farming. Yes. But now, get a load of this, Dina, only 2%, 2% only farm now. Yeah, it's sad. It's just, it almost breaks my heart. And the, what we're doing to our current farming soil, which we'll get into later, is even more heartbreaking. So I'll let you continue, but yes. No, it is. It's exactly right. So guys, um, you know, moving forward, uh, Lincoln, he really became an advocate for farm to table. And he really worked in the direction of getting us to that point. But then... <laughs> All of a sudden, here comes Roosevelt, and Roosevelt decides we need to find a little better way. We've obviously got some issues with our products, and we need to find a way to genetically modify this to a point where we can pull those out and put what they considered a more pure product on the market. So that's when we get into the GMO. So GMO, everyone, is genetically modified organisms. And that began later, even though Roosevelt started it, <laughs> it didn't develop until the 1970s. So well, I think this, too, yeah. just kind of to hit it, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry, right. uh, but like, I think it's important to recognize there's a difference between making a crop better versus what we consider now GMO. So just to kind of clarify. Um, right. You're right. Yeah. So <laughs> and we're going to clarify that because you're absolutely right. It's mm -hmm. one thing to mess with something, but what are you going to turn around and create on the other side? So um, just to kind of clarify, how did GMO get started and what does it actually involve? So GMO starts with introducing a bacteria into the plant but it originally got started introducing a bacteria to a bacteria to see what it could genetically make. Uh, when they figured that out in 1973, that is when uh, they started that whole process of figuring how, how they could actually introduce it to the plant systems. Mm. 1994, we got our first GMO tomato. The I, tomato. Think, I think I actually remember that. <laughs> I think I do. I think I re vaguely remember, and I think I was appalled back then. But anyway. Well, I was wondering because I don't recall it. I mean, I was pregnant at the time, so, you know, mm -hmm. 
I'm in pregnancy fog brain probably at that point, but I do not remember that tomato. It's a, and yeah, it's, it's I a vague memory. It but... was maybe a potato, but not a tomato. <laughs> but that's okay. I guess that potato, was potato, 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 right? tomato. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and again, why do they want GMO? Well, they want GMO because pests. They are trying to keep the pest, number one, having to use pesticides. So that's one thing. They mm -hmm. want to keep away from having to use pesticides. But the other side of the coin is that some of the crops of plants actually have disease processes. So they are pulling out that disease, introducing a bacteria so that it kills that process mm -hmm. and gives right. us our genetically modified food. What they haven't really come to terms with yet and they're still working on is the fact that when they introduce it, while we still have this opportunity and we see things going the way they are, we have allergies now that have come in play and we have cancerous activity that we're noticing as well. So right. that's a whole nother topic, guys, for a whole nother day. <laughs> yes. So, yep. Absolutely. So then going into uh, the non-GMO. Now, before I go into non-GMO, I want to say most of our GMO stuff is found in corn, cotton, and soybeans. Those are your three major opportunities for GMOs. So the future, of course, is that they would like to genetically modify all foods. So in case we run out of our ability to soil, which we talked about this, you know, you just tapped on it just a few minutes ago. If we run out of that opportunity, they'll genetically modify accordingly. That's well, I think, too, like even just saying that out loud, I feel like you're creating a hot mess by even thinking that like if you have to go that direction and there's other op you know I just feel like the fact that it's almost like a like a tightly wound situation where it's going to implode at some point because but there are other opportunities to do other things with our soil right now correct and, you know I know that there's been uh huge topics here lately Mm -hmm. about how there's not a lot of produce out and why aren't the farmers actually producing um and that topic has been they are being paid not to produce right now because they're doing Correct. different things with the soil which you're going to tap on that here in just mm -hmm. a little bit so i just want to briefly wrap this up um the other side of things is the non-gmo side so the non-gmo side there's actually a project called non-gmo and guys when i started doing my research it's really like it took the cake for me. Um, I did not know there was a non-GMO project started back in 2017. Um, it started with two grocers, one in Cali and one in Canada. They came mm. together to create this project. Um, and with that goal set, they wanted to create a standardized definition for non-GMO food because they were digging into the research themselves. I mean, this is a grocer, a local grocer in California is deciding that there's an issue with our GMO food and there's a grocer in Canada and how these two meet, the story is unbelievable. But when they meet, they come together with the fact of we need to standardize this and we need to get back to a non-GMO situation. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did not realize is how much GMO, non-GMO and then organic. So right. when this all mm -hmm. comes into play, we have an organic certification process. So this really got me too. When we are looking at the non-GMO side of foods and we're looking at this project, do you know you have to be a member of the project to get your food certified as non-GMO? Did not know that. Okay. You have to pay for the membership to be a non-GMO certified producer. No oh, interesting. The strict guidelines you have to follow. Okay. Yeah. So there are certifications that you do have to follow. So mm -hmm. that was interesting to even be organic to the which is that. which is so backwards in some ways because it's kind of like if you would just leave everything alone, it would all be organic anyway. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about as far as like creating a tightly wound system where it's kind of like you keep piling on um, organizations or processes or rules and regulations and things like that so again trying to avoid the whole rabbit hole thing right now because we're going to get deeper into it but again it's no, just kind no. of that spiraling effect of going down it where is it's, it's You're absolutely placing right. a band-aid over a band-aid over a band-aid over a band-aid so let's go back to the beginning it all started in government mm -hmm. and in my opinion government got greedy mm -hmm. and then government thought oh we need to think about the future right but we didn't think about the future in the right direction. 
Well, what's the future? You have to define the future. What's That's the future? True. Like the future to whom? For the government or for the people or for both or for financial situations? Like what is that? What is the future? Because it's really question. relevant. It's really relevant to who is in charge. It's very relevant. making those decisions. Because that's so. how the Department of Agriculture got created. It is mm -hmm. how the USDA farm, the FDA farm. So from my perspective, I believe that the government, you know, is thinking of the future, you know, and we as people need to think of the future. We need to start turning our soil back into where exactly. I totally we agree need with you. to take advantage of where our food is coming from because mm -hmm. you and I've talked about this. You and I both are gardening like rabbits, you know, <laughs> we're gardening like crazy because we want to know where our food came from. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So we, we need mm -hmm. to take a hold of this situation and not allow that to be governed the way it is. So I believe that we need to move forward in that direction. Yeah. And which we'll tap on this later. But the other thing is, is that it is, it is, kind of a natural instinct to trust authority. That's just kind of how we're built. Sure. And so when that authority, like the FDA or USDA, we're kind of under the assumption that they have our best interest at heart, which is not always the case. You have to think money will always come first, which right. means you will not be first. That's so right. we'll get into that later, but um, which is another reason why, why garden? Like, why is that becoming such a hot topic right Absolutely. now? So. I'll let you carry on, but yeah, that's exactly. Oh, no. I forgot we're going to wrap this up because I'm ready for you to go right on into this next part. So let's talk about the labeling process really quickly, and then we're going to go into the benefits, and I'm going to tap on those. So the labeling process is even more messed up. So the labeling mm -hmm. process has gotten to the point where people are confused. What's oh, yeah. non-GMO? What's organic? What's GMO? So basically, in a nutshell, back in 2020, the government decided that they would start a whole relabeling process. And by 2022, January, supposedly our relabeling process came about um, with a whole new be verified signal. So you have a circle and it says be verified. And that's what our new Mm -hmm. labeling is consisting of. Now, what that means is, is that if you see that labeling, that means that not only is it not genetically modified, but it can be a non-GMO and an organic at that point. So mm -hmm. you watching your labels and ask questions, always mm -hmm. ask questions. You know, if you're not asking the questions and you're not getting the answers, right? Or do your own research, the that's out here. Oh, for sure. Yeah. sure. You know, that you're utilizing your, uh, your tools is what I should say. Mm -hmm. So really quickly, and I'm going to wrap up on my side, is why gardening in the sense of the health benefits. There are so many health benefits, and I'm going to tap on this briefly. We may come back and do another podcast with this whole information. Oh, right? I have a feeling. I have a feeling. <laughs> yes. I feel like we have several topics here that we're going to oh, tap for sure. on. So, for sure. yes. um, so make sure you're hitting that subscribe button, guys, because we got a whole lot more to come. Mm -hmm. All right. So benefit-wise, and this is something I just want to tap on, and um, Dina, I want you to go right on in. The Parkinson's disease, the Alzheimer's disease was huge. When I did the research into why gardening, you know, why getting out, why starting your own process, the health benefits were huge, you know, the vitamin C, the vitamin D, you know, getting out and actually utilizing that brain process. And because you receive vitamin D from getting out and gardening, you actually are giving the vitamins and nourishment to the brain that you need in order to keep yourself from, you know, taking a hold, Alzheimer's taking a hold or Parkinson's taking a hold. Now, while we cannot change what the government's already done in the sense of, you know, our food, we can change where we are at today. And we can begin by starting our own gardens and mm -hmm. getting our own health benefits out of that, not only to the physical side and mental side, but getting ourselves into that farm to table process where you know where your food's coming from, you know you didn't put pesticides on it, you know that it's not genetically modified. So I wanna encourage everyone to definitely, uh, you know, listen to this podcast even deeper because now Dean is gonna tell us even more about the rippling effects of how this can be. So go ahead, Dina. Well, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that the things that you listed being outside, you know, all that kind of stuff, th these are natural things that we should be doing in general. 
personal. So Absolutely. I don't want people to think that going into gardening and all this other kind of having to do all this research, like go back to sim the simplicity of life. I mean, that yeah. really is kind of what we're talking. That's the rabbit hole I was talking about. Like right. You're so overcomplicating yeah. food and nutrition that it is something that people tend to stay away from, I think, because it's, it's people are busy, you know, exactly. they don't want to feel like their food has become so overly complicated that they're just going to eat whatever's in food. Like, you know, it's just whatever. Like, it's kind of on the back burner. Right. But, but in yeah. reality, it's just sure. literally about getting outside. It's, it's eating simply. Right. Fruits and vegetables, like eating whole foods, like the, you know, they always talk about going on the outsides of the uh, the grocery store because that's where more of your natural foods are and less processed stuff. Right. Um, but just eating kind of more in that direction. But um, I just wanted to throw that out there. It's not super complicated. It's become overcomplicated right. through the systems that have been created. But exactly. um, let me get into the ripple effect here. But you know, I think some of the things we talked about earlier was that it's become more popular because I think people do want ripe food. They want food that they, they want to know where it's coming from. Because again, you and I had also discussed that some of this is coming from overseas and, you know, it's being, it's being picked before reaching its full ripeness and things like that. No chemicals. Um, they want, you know, we, we all want more control of what we're consuming. And I right. think that that's kind of the main thing is which i'll get into in a minute but we've kind of been bamboozled a little bit because some of this stuff i don't think that we necessarily agree to participate in it's it's been taken out of our hands Absolutely. but gardening is a way to put it back into your hands literally right as we garden Absolutely. but um but anyway getting into the ripple effect of gardening because we were talking about you know when you think about gardening you think um, you know, there's more nutrition in it. It's whole foods. We talked about the, the physical and even the mental aspects of it just a little bit. Um, you know, it also works on social skills. It lowers the risks of certain cancers, those types of things. But food is medicine. But even on a bigger scale, as far as like, far, like you're providing food not only to yourself, you know, but the way that you can actually participate in gardening, like let's pretend you're just living in a small apartment, which again, we'll get into later because this is such a huge topic. But, um, but you know, there's other ways to participate. There's local farms that you can participate in getting food from. There's farm to table, there's farmer's markets, there's CSAs, which we'll t I'll touch base on in a little bit. Um, there's even restaurants like, we, well, farm to table, but those restaurants, which is really, I love that. And I'll put a link up on how to find um, restaurants that do that because you can just Google that, to be honest with you. And then honestly, there's community gardens and things like that where you can actually grow the community side of things. So there's so much involved with gardening that you can provide food to your neighbor. You can provide food to your friends. You can, yeah, I mean, you can provide food to organizations like just by simply having a few pots container pots of some food like there's a lot that really kind of just by you doing the simple act of having a few containers of gardening can actually create a nice community ripple effect which is really cool Absolutely. but um but anyway so there was one situation where um, i was kind of reading up on this and somebody had said that they had actually donated it because you do you the amount of food that you get from one seed i just watched a video the other day where this guy basically burst open a blueberry and the amount of food that this blueberries that this thing produced was unbelievable but this uh, other person had made a comment that they actually donated their food to meals on or what is it meals on wheels yeah so nonprofit organizations. So there's things like that that you can so give back to. You mentioned that to me, I actually contacted Meals on Wheels because I'm going to have an abundance of tomatoes uh -huh. that I cannot use. Right. They're, they're going to take them. So mm -hmm. they'll put them out. Oh, yeah. awesome. They're going to take them. So whatever I've got left over, they said give them to them. That makes me yeah. happy. <laughs> I, I was really happy that they're going to take them <laughs> and that they're not going to be wasted. That was my issue. Didn't want them to be wasted. So how you can make it happen as far as like just gardening things like that because um, I know it can seem like well I'm not a gardener 
into that um, a tad bit later, but um, I just kind of wanted to touch base again, like on some of those things that how you can participate um, and how it affects those around you in a positive light. So those are just some examples, but I did want to kind of get into, and if you're ready to move on, Michelle, yeah. um, you know, I think that some of the things that you talked about earlier was it's kind of this um, opposite ends of the spectrum. Like we have these big conglomerates, we have politics involved, you know, we have the, we have issues such that we get some of our products um, and produce from other countries. Yes, we do. And then war happens. I mean, this thing is right. like global when you think about the food industry and things oh, like that. Absolutely. It's a global, yes. So, but if you can just kind of turn away from that, I live in an apartment right now and just focus on my little balcony of food. That's literally as simple as it gets to put some power back into your own hands. Because like I said earlier, I feel like we were a little bit bamboozled because as far as like, I mean, I'm gonna guess that there was good intentions as far as how to create more food for the masses, which is great. That's not a bad idea. But when you start destroying and basically putting yourself in a position to where if something bad happens now, people are actually starving because we don't have access to food because you're too reliant on other countries right. or you've depleted the farming industry of being able to grow certain crops because the soil is bad. I mean, this is like a huge, like we talked about earlier, this is the negative ripple effect that has taken place. So, um, you know, getting our food from overseas, we talked about that. Like what if something happens? I mean, we've just been kind of hit with the whole, Ukraine war and how gas prices have been affected and those types of things. So what's to say it can't affect our food industry? Well, um, I mean, technically it has in many senses. So oh, you know, we're, we're seeing a shortage of food at this point. You know? Baby formula. Baby, baby formula is huge right now. I mean, I get it. You know, we, we've got a, a, a company that is back up and running now. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, why did our babies have to suffer this situation at this point? You know, right. Um, so, yes, we have that right now with farm, you know, not mm -hmm. able to come to the table and the countries that are supplying us are not able to get that to us. So mm -hmm. because of the situation. So let's let's talk a little bit about farms just for a minute or so. Right. One of the things that really caught my attention was the documentary Kiss the Ground. Um, I don't know if you've actually seen it yet. It is such a, I love the documentary, but it's basically talking about regenerative farming because a lot, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of farmers are kind of being forced to grow certain crops in order to make Thank money. God. And and these are the types of situations that kind of irk me and get under my skin because um, you know, some farmers have, have actually taken or made the tough decision to kind of start from ground zero and just do the farm that they how they want to do it. And I, I'm just going to throw out the fact that they're probably hurting for money to get back to the way that they want to farm. God bless sure. them. But um, but because because they're forced to grow specific crops all the time, they're depleting the soil. So there's difference between soil and dirt. Right. So what's happening is certain crops will deplete the soil more than others. And so sometimes the rotation of certain crops will actually regenerate, mm -hmm. right? That's and great. there's also the use of chemicals and we're not letting nature um, kind of do its work, which is what right. you slightly mentioned in the very beginning, which is, I think that sometimes we're a little arrogant in the we sense are. that we think we can do better. But when you start allowing natural growth in your crops, uh, and what I mean by that, I'm not necessarily saying weeds per se, but just the natural growth of the environment. Right. When you have worms and things like that, just kind of go and you have, you know, you have crops and livestock kind of mixed in together. Like there's just this natural way of things right. that help create a very nutritious, um, a very well-rounded soil which goes into our food and those types of things. Absolutely. So um, so what's happening now, I'm, I'm actually starting to taste the difference. Then there's no nutritional value in your food. It doesn't taste the same. There's a lack of flavor um, due to the depletion. Of, it's funny you say that because they say in the GMO side of things, that's where you lose your flavor. 
that was the research. Like I said, we can talk about that a different time. Oh, we can dive in now because we're going to be going all over the place. So try to hang in there with us, folks, because I was telling Michelle earlier, I go, this topic is literally a springboard for Absolutely. politics for what, I mean, my gosh, you can go in so many different directions, but um so anyway, so I recommend, I'm gonna actually post the link to, I wanted to mention this, um, to watch the documentary, it's but also, documentary. oh, it's really fascinating because it kind of opens your eyes up to the possibilities instead of how we're doing things now. But the other thing is, is I'm also gonna post the link to regenerative farming um, because it tells you ways that you can get involved or just even learn more about it. Because um, to me, it's completely fascinating because when you think about all of the, the amazing richness of what soil can provide to your food and just in general. I don't know what, call me a geek, no. don't care, but it's really fascinating to no, me. No, we need more people so. to get interested. We need them to become more interested in their own food at this point. So, But I also think too, like doing documentaries like that, it almost opens the door to allow farmers to say, you know what, it's okay to do your own thing. Yeah. Like let's let's get back on track here. Put the power back into your own hands. And again, I'm not completely opposed to some things, but I think it's gone a little too far. So I think that um, I think with that being said, to to focus more locally than nationally or internationally, because I think that that's going to provide better produce, better product, um, and those types of things. But absolutely, absolutely, I'm, I'm looking forward yeah. to this. <laughs> but also I wanted to talk about too, Michelle and I were talking about this. I mean, there's so many other, I know I keep saying that, so I'll be quiet about it, but there's a lot of topics. Um, the other thing that on the other side of the coin, cause we're talking about food distribution basically mm -hmm. is people who live in areas that are uh, cities basically that have food deserts right. so some of you may have never even heard of what a food desert is but um I'm, let me see here i've got my little definition i didn't here. know what it was until you mentioned it because you <laughs> you talked about it so it made me of course get online i'm like researching yeah and it's Very really it is interesting because you don't really think about it because hmm. well let me just describe what a food desert is it's where nutritious food is often like super expensive or it's unavailable meaning that it's usually in a low income area. Okay. So these places are designated as food deserts. So they're in low income areas. There's high rates of chronic disease. So what happens is, is that say you're living in a city, low income, you'll see a lot of fast food chains, but no grocery stores. So the probably, you know, you have to think if you're in a low income, maybe there's not transportation. You know, people are walking to get their food and those types of things. Or, you know, we're, like I said, we're busy or we're creatures, you know, we're, what was that? Creatures of habit or creatures comfort, of habit. comfort, comfort, yeah. right? So we'll go to what's easily accessible, which a lot of times in those areas, fast food is easily accessible, right? But it's not healthy. So again, you're kind of creating a chronic disease situation due to the lack of nutrients that people are receiving. So probably the closest thing to a grocery store that might be right down the street would be like, um, just like a gas station grocery store type of a thing. So those are all over the place. But the interesting thing was, was I did some research. I live in, uh, in Texas in Austin and the national average for a food, de food desert is 10.9% kind of in cities. Austin is 14.7% where Austin residents were considered to have food insecurity in 2021, which is huge. Cause you don't, here's the problem with all of this. We all live, most of us in a city and you look around most of the time, you're like, there's food. Like you don't really think about it, but this is a big problem because people don't have access, which is a whole other reason why community gardens are popping up and people are starting to, put them in areas such as in food deserts, because I think it's a, such a brilliant idea because there's, um, you know, you're bringing back community, you're providing good nutrition, good nutritional food um, and those types of things and trying to fight back with those types of areas that are really destructive. So um, I don't know, if, I think you did some research too, huh? No, you made me think about a, a trip that I took down to 
Florida. And on our way, we were on our way to Mississippi. So it made me think about where we found some really good fruit. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, it wasn't a low income area and there was nothing but fast food restaurants around. I, I don't recall a grocery store probably within maybe 10 miles. Mm -hmm. It was probably 10 miles or at least 10 to 15 miles before we could get to a grocery store. Yeah. They had fresh fruit everywhere. And of course we loaded up. Um, but that's, that's really sad. You know, that their government in their own local community is not pushing for a grocery store, you know, to be closer in that area and take away those fast food restaurants. Because it, like you said, you're inviting chronic illness at this point. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's just like, if you're living off of fast food, that's a problem, Absolutely. you know, but sometimes you just can't get, it's, sometimes you just can't get to the food and that's right. the problem. There are 33 food deserts in Austin alone. Oh, wow. So they actually, I think that they're, they created, it's called Austin. Uh, there's a food insecurity awareness day, which is April 21st. I think it's Austin. I think Austin did create Austin. Um, but anyway, um, you can always go online farming community. I mean, Texas has always been known as, as your big farmers. Well, you isn't know? that ironic? Right. That's a whole topic. That could be a whole topic. Right? In and stuff. Like why are, why am I in the midst of a, of a farming state and there are that many food deserts? That's a good question. Why? Like we're the almost the highest in the nation. Yeah. So that right there can kind of almost paint you a picture of, what we think is going on versus what is actually going on. Exactly. You know? So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it's kind of hard. It's almost hard to talk about this topic because it does branch out into so many areas of like, you know, but again, the whole topic is why should you garden? And this is literally like, I mean, it's a sweeping, I and mean, we're, you're, you're probably, we're, we're planting the seeds for everyone to, you know, stay tuned because right. we've made the decision. We're going to definitely go down some of these rabbit holes for you. Right. So, so, you know, and it, so yeah, it's just kind of funny because I can almost feel my own brain bouncing around to like right. and this and this and this, and I'm trying to stay focused stay as focused. far as like just keeping it real. Right. Because there is so much. Stay on task. <laughs> it's hard. It's very challenging. Right. So, um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so anyway, we we're talking about that. So food deserts and things. So I'm going to try to stay focused here. That's okay. We got this. Um, but the thing that I wanted to touch base on just real quick too, which I've already mentioned is the thing that is kind of starting to bother me just on a bigger perspective is that we're kind of expected to absorb what the government is doing or what the USDA throws out. And again, I go, I go back to the idea that you know, these entities were put into place. We were meant to trust them. We were meant to expect that we that, that they have our best interest at heart. Um, but even just recently watching another, do, I'm a documentary guru, um, the one that is on the fishing industry. The problem with the industry is that they're not truthful. Right. So just for example, I know we're talking about gardening, but the fishing industry, like Dolphin Safe, those types of things, your eyes really get open to what exactly is Dolphin Safe and how are they monitoring it? And But here's my point. All of these industries are in it for the money. I mean, let's just be honest, I'm not going to candy coat That's it. That's exactly why they're in it. It's for the money. But then what happens, kind of goes into recycling as well, is it, it's put back onto the consumer to do their part. Like, right recycle or only buy products from XYZ when even those products aren't really truly what who they say they are. But if we really wanted to fix the industry, it's possible. But because money's involved, and I mean any of these industries, right. the fishing industry, the you know, recycling and recycling those types industry, of things, yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, creating new packaging or whatever the case may be, I think it's totally possible. But what's happening is it's being placed back on the consumer. Like I'm going to like, I felt guilty for eating fish, you know, or like those types of things when it's like, how can I, I can't change that. Like I can't go against massive amounts of global entities and even national entities that have all the control. Right. So to say that once again, to get control a little bit more back into your hands, personal gardening, even if it's a small amount, can help you 
Absolutely. and those people around you and even your community. And that's really so, where you need to start. Just start within your own realm of where you're at and take control back in your own home. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's indoor gardening, outdoor gardening, as you know, Dina and I are going to talk about here in a few minutes. Just grab your own control back in your own home. You've got the mm -hmm. realm, it's here. Go for it. Um, so go ahead, Dina, and, and explain that part of it to us. Oh, you mean the gar the gardening part? Yeah, let's let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So all, all this knowledge. <laughs> I, I I'm a I feel like I'm a little mini farmer, but I really am. I, I wish I could actually dabble more into the, in the farming industry, which I kind of hope to do um, soon because I just moved to Austin. I really want to get to know like where my local farms are. Um, and again, that's all. <laughs> I'm sitting here having memories of Colorado when I used to actually go to farms. Right. I would pay 10 bucks and they would literally take you on a tractor and you yanked out as much food as you wanted. It was which awesome. I found out we have one of those. Mm-hmm. We have so, those, so the thing is too. Don't forget, guys. This is so fun for your kids. Like right. they love. I, I gave seeds in a little pot to some of my skaters as a birthday gift, and there was other skaters who were like, "Oh my god, I love planting seeds." Mm -hmm. They love this stuff, guys. It's such an amazing thing to do with your family. Like, so, so we'll get into. Love it. They love oh, it. it's ever bit of it. Can we pick I mean, the strawberries? No. <laughs> well, I don't think I've ever talked to an adult who says that they hated that their family had a garden or a farm. I've never was, talked to anybody that said they hated it, no. Yeah, I mean, if anything, it's good memories or like, I oh my gosh. I grew up on a farm and, and the things it's taught me that you wouldn't think it mm -hmm. actually taught you, you know, now I'm using, you know, we had right. a garden and, you know, like I told you, I didn't realize the flowers, you know, grandma never explained why the flowers were in the middle of the garden. Well, now I know why they're there. <laughs> and why are they there? Because we talked they're about there that to pollinate. They're there to pollinate yeah. and keep other things away from your garden so that you actually can get your garden growth. So mm -hmm. there's that. So, yeah. Right. So, yeah, so yeah. we're going to get into specifics about what you can do that, um, can seem fairly easy to get started. So I'm just going to actually list off of a few things and one of them might pique your interest and then we'll kind of go a little bit into it. But um, starting your own garden and I know some of you are like, oh no, I'm, I have a black thumb and all that kind of stuff. So there's some options here that we're going to talk about. Personally, I don't believe in black thumbs. I think sometimes they get, things get ultra complicated when they don't need to be. Um, sometimes I just plop some seeds in dirt and I sit back and I watch because I really truly believe that nature knows what it's doing. Yeah, so I don't sit there. I don't have a, I don't have a cabinet full of chemicals. I have dirt, water, some sunshine, and we'll get into that a little bit later and just let it do its thing. So, but with that I said, I peak of basil today and I planted it two weeks ago. So I'm super excited. Oh I got a little one peeking right out. <laughs> I go, I go outside and I shake my basil and then I go over and shake my rosemary and I'm just, I want to do that. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, it's, it's very amazing. Up. <laughs> so, okay. So like if you have a backyard, I know some of you also live in apartments like I do, but um, there's raised flower beds or we call them flower beds but raised beds where they're just basically made of wood and that um like say for instance you have concrete in the back and you need a place plots of dirt you can do raised beds which you can actually purchase um you don't have to build them or anything there you can go to costco to be honest with you and purchase some of these things or anywhere they're they're everywhere <laughs> um, just wherever go grab oh them. yeah so there's those. Um, container gardening is a big thing. So I have a balcony, which um, I used to almost be embarrassed how many pepper plants I'd have out there, but I gave some of those away. Um, I love growing jalapenos, but so container, you'd be surprised what you can grow in a container. I'm growing, I'm growing peas right now and vines and to be, and the environment, like I love it because my balcony is full of vines. Like it's, it's awesome. Um, so the other options are like obviously if you have a plot of land you could just start start with easy stuff i do want to throw out that you don't have to start with seeds you can go to the store and yeah. buy um pre ready, you know pre-sprouted right yeah. um if you want to give it a whirl you know and kind of figure out if what you like to grow and what you don't like to grow or even if you know peppers and things like that are super easy to take care of they're very resistant so even things like that um 
figure out what's kind of good and hearty to kind of start off with. So you don't feel like you're, you're start, you know, right. if they happen to die off, you're like, see, I can't do it. Um, but anyway, so just a quick little Google search might help you find something to get started with. Um, another way. So let's pretend you don't want anything on your property, but there's local community gardens where you can just participate once a week or just you tell them, and to be honest with you, a lot of them get filled up and you get your, you end up on waiting lists because they've become so popular. Yeah. Um, that's an option. The other thing I wanted to talk about here in a little bit is tower gardens, which I'll pop up some pictures so you can see what those are. Those are really very cool. Um, I plan on getting one because I haven't gotten one because I just moved to Austin not that long ago and we're moving again. So I didn't want to buy this tower garden, but I'll show it to you in a little bit. Um, but I don't want you to think like these types of things are intimidating. I think that because we have really ventured away from doing these types of things, it's not really incorporated into our current lifestyle. It does seem very intimidated or intimidating. Or we tend to think we have a black thumb that we can't grow anything and then we'll just leave it to the farmers and I'll just go buy it at the grocery store, like those types of things, which in essence is fine. I do encourage you to buy non-GMO and organic just going to throw that out there. Right. But, um, you know, but I think the whole idea is to start off by just having fun with it. Like, don't, don't sit there and create a stress situation. Um, figure out what you like Parking to do. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed oh, to be a relaxing, be relaxing yeah. process. I mean, mm -hmm. I've never heard anyone say, oh, this garden is so stressful. No. I've always heard them say, I love going out to my garden and sitting there and, you know, pruning the shrubs or whatever the case may be, you know, pulling all the weeds away from them, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be, it is a relaxing situation to them. So, and yeah. So and I think garden. mentally like nurturing yeah. something, there's something about that, that really kind of grounds you, no pun intended, no, but does. I think it does like it it's, does. and you have to be mindful. Like when you're doing things like that, the rest of the world just kind of falls away and it's it's easy to find that relaxed state and so i think that's another thing and i think some of us could really use that <laughs> do you know what i mean like it would decrease anxiety it would uh -huh. reduce, and that's the that's the health benefits that we were talking about it re, you know it reduces anxiety it decreases depression mm -hmm. it increases brain activity to you know want to motivate and inspire so mm -hmm. I say go for it. Just just go. Don't put too much thought into it. Just go do it. You know, I've got oh, totally. uh, I've got ten or twelve tomato plants out here that I don't even know what I'm going to do with yet. So you know, other than take them to. <laughs> Well, let's talk about that too, because you live in Missouri, which is where I also lived, and winters can be very harsh there. They right? can. And summers can actually, like, it's in the hundreds right now here in Texas. So you know, there's also those types of factors, but this is really a good kind of segue to get into some tower gardens. Absolutely. So what I wanted to do was just post some pictures here. So this is another great option. Whereas you don't have to have it necessarily a super green thumb to do, but I'm just going to show you there's two systems. Now I'm just going to throw this out there because this isn't a this isn't like a full push for me to sell tower gardens, but I do sell them on my website if you're interested in that. But with that being said, there's two different types of um, tower gardens that you can that you can purchase and I'm going to show those to you because it's super cool um, let me go ahead and get this open and I just want to point out being you know someone who is in a state where it's not sunshiny all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> and the temperature you know plummets into the 20s or lower um, yes these are a great a great way to continue oh, your garden throughout the winter months. Oh, so it's becoming so hugely so popular. Like Absolutely. it's, it takes the ease. I mean, it's just easy. It kind of is self-contained and that's kind of the thing that I love about it. Yeah. You have full control, like as you can see up here, and I'm just going to scroll through this quickly because we're not going to actually have like a full presentation on tower gardens. I just kind of wanted people to see what they are. Sure. So this is the tower. This is the home growing with the lights. So this is one that you can put inside your house. I do believe that you can take the lighting off if you do want to put it outside for the summer months. Okay. So this one, you can grow 32 plants right now. Wow. So up on the top here, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor? I'm not sure. But if you look on the top of that tower garden, there's a little bit smaller holes. Can you see that cursor? Yep. 
Okay, so up here, and that's kind of where you can grow some herbs, and then they get a little bit bigger as you go down. Like, I think this is rhubarb right it here. It looks like rhubarb. So, but if you want to do something that's outside, this is called the flex growing system. So again, um, as you can see, it's very bountiful, and it doesn't take a lot of space. So you can literally grow, grow an entire garden, which is phenomenally like kids love these and i'm just going to throw this out there because i forgot to mention it before when i was talking to you michelle they actually have a program for schools to to okay. have um tower gardens so that the school like the schools can get the kids involved and things like that so good. That's also teaching them how to mm -hmm. you know uh use the soil or however you know teaching them the organic growth of how, oh exactly you know, so now these awesome. are non yeah and then what comes with these is non-gmo organic seeds okay cool so awesome. these are the two options that you have here for for this particular system um but yeah so you have these these two which is i i actually love these i can't wait to get mine and i know that was um, huge for me too just to kind of tap on what you said non-gmo organic seeds correct so that was huge with me when i was planting my items as well was that mm -hmm. i did not want anything that if it wasn't labeled or listed and i couldn't figure it out it had to say it you know so oh absolutely and, and like this I, to pe for people to know when you're oh. searching for your seeds or searching for your plants even that are already you know pre-growth and you're going mm -hmm. to put them in make sure you know you're getting your non-gmo organic you know get those exactly and I'm just going to click on, I hope this, um, let's see here. I'm going to stop. Hold on. I'm going to go ahead. I wanted to click up onto another screen here because I wanted to show you what is actually available to you. So let me go ahead and give you another idea of what um, is um, possible for you on here, which is to me, I love this. This is so cool. So if you look up here, this is fruits and vegetables up here. So I'm just going to quickly, I'm not going to name off all these, obviously, but if this is just fruits and vegetables that you grow in that tower garden right here. That's so awesome. As you can see, there's just so much. There's um, okra, there's pak choy, there's peas, da dandelions, garbanzo beans, like there's broccoli. But again, if I click here, these are all the herbs that I could grow. This and that's my seed. side of things. I mm -hmm. like the herbs. So. Yes. What's cool about the tower gardens is you can do herbs up on top, and then you can do your fruits and vegetables towards the bottom because the, the pods are a little right. bit um, The other thing is, too, as Miss Michelle has mentioned, flowers. These are all the flowers you can plant in there. And, and quite, quite frankly, you know, when I was doing the research, it, it mentions that in, you know, even with your gardening of your towers and things like that, you really should have some flowers mixed in mm -hmm. there because that is going to help that pollinate, you know, and keep pests and things like that away. Even though it may be inside, I completely get it. But you realize you do have pests inside your home. They're, they're micro, oh. but they're there. And flowers well, help keep that away. Oh, exactly. And I think that the other thing is, too, is that let's not forget about what the ambiance it creates. Right. I mean, again, this goes back to creating mental health, um, good mental health, um, just having that environment of healthy growing things around you. I mean, have you ever walked up to your plant and said, I'm grouchy today. I just want to, you know, I just want to gripe you out. I mean, have you ever, nobody's done that. You know what I mean? Like I, I literally walk up to my strawberry plant and I talk to my strawberry plant, you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel its leaves. I'm checking it out and I'm telling her how beautiful she is and she's just flourishing like she's mm -hmm. just great but keep in mind that's my mental health that plants mental health as well yeah. they know that you're touching they i mean oh yeah live organism come on there so, are some massive studies on i have to do a podcast yeah, there's another rabbit hole. <laughs> the way i mean if you really knew what plants were capable there i mean it's phenomenal they are, like, they're i mean they are the biggest mental health you know um but even how they take care out. of <laughs> i mean i read something that even the root systems of trees or yeah. plants will actually not take in as much water if they have seedlings next to them so that those seedlings can absorb exactly. more nutrients in water like they're they're living breathing they are organized live or yeah organized. live organisms they and they they feel they you know they know the touch they know 
vibrations when you speak. I mean, I'm not saying they understand what you're saying. I'm just saying that, you know, it is very clear that if I don't talk to a plant versus talking to a plant, which one's doing very well? Oh, they, they did a study where, I mean, they had, they did an experiment yeah. Yeah. where they had one plant and another one where this one, I think it was in a museum. I it think. was and it's side by side side by side so they were a little bit apart but this one they were told yep. people were told to yell or like do, be negative and this one was right. positive this one was dying this one was flourishing it was and it's um you know think about it i mean that's why they say talk to your talk to yourself or talk to your family right. like you would talk to your plants right exactly. <laughs> it I only makes sense every day with so much love and tender care and they're flourishing i've got i'm not kidding you should see these tomatoes they are going to uh -huh. And if whatever Meals and Wheels is not going to take, Meals on Wheels is not going to take, I'm going to put it out and just have the community, because I've got a huge community out here, here, take it. You know, at least I know it's oh. to go somewhere to feed a family. So Yeah, and I think it's just, just, I mean, have you ever been given like a bag of food from, say, hey, this is from my yeah. garden and I absolutely get that feeling of like, oh my gosh. Like, like, I'm so great, you know, I, I, I would love to have this, you know, how do you know I needed that? I mean, there's right. so many thought processes. You don't know what somebody's going through. And it's amazing what a bag of fruit or a bag of vegetables can do for someone. You oh, know? yeah. I used it to take in. A week. Yeah, I would take in peppers. Oh like, you know, because that's kind of, I love, pep I love jalapenos. I throw them on everything. I'm, I'm waiting for my peppers to come up. So. So am I. I like, they'll, they'll be here soon, I promise. Yeah. But the rain will stay away. I'll get them even quicker. So Yeah, they're kind of hanging out right now. But again, just play with it, guys. Have fun with it. Kind of venture out. And I do want to touch base. I think I do have a website up here. I just kind of wanted to touch base. Um, and we're going to place all of these links yeah. in our uh, bio, you know, for you guys. So if you have any questions at all, just make sure you're tapping on the links below. Uh, they will be listed in the comments and okay. um, we, we in, invite you, you know, yeah. to comment. And I'll <laughs> yeah, I'll post these, but I did want to mention one thing. I don't know if everybody knows what a CSA is. I know, but so we need to address that. We need to. Right. So a CSA, um, that's funny because I don't exactly... Anyway, CSA, I, I totally forgot what it stands for. But if you hear CSA, that's funny, I forgot that. You can sign up for local CSAs, which means you can get a box of food delivered to you from your local farms, which I used to do, um, funny enough, in San Diego. Um, so I would get um, like fruits and vegetables and things like that delivered to me. Sometimes I'd be surprised and sometimes I would pick food that I wanted. This is a little bit different than those um, than those things like imperfect foods and things like that. These are actual, um, usually you can, sometimes you can pick depending on how the CSA is designed or whatever, how they have their websites and things like that set up. But um, I would literally just get a box of food and it was kind of like a surprise every week what I would get in it. And it was kind of fun to be honest with you, but it did come from a local farm. So I was getting my fruits and vegetables locally and there were things in there that I had never tried before, which was which was really cool. So it kind of exposed me to new to new vegetables and stuff like that that I hadn't tried before. So yeah, so you can actually go to a local website. I I think it's on um, which we'll link, but you can go to local food directories through the USDA, which um, can tell you where your local CSA. But honestly, if you just Google it, like CSAs near me. Mm -hmm. you'll find websites mm -hmm. and things like that that'll help you out. So just kind of do some research. The biggest thing that I would highly recommend though, is just make sure that that farm is non-GMO and organic. Um, because you tap on that. <laughs> yeah. Cause to be, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest things as far as, um, you know, they're putting a lot of work into their farms in order for that to happen. So sure. highly recommend to have a, have a conversation with them if you want to. Even when you go to farmers markets, that's a whole other industry. Like, make sure that they're, you know, do a little bit of research if you want. Um, I mean, support is support. However, some of them are claiming to be organic or non-GMO. And they're not. So please make sure you're checking those out because it does happen. Are you really getting what you're purchasing? Right. Which goes back. This This goes all the way up like USDA, am I really getting what you're telling me I'm getting? And I'm going to vote no, nine vote times no. out of 10. 
not because it's just it's just not happening guys it, it just is not because I was telling Michelle earlier trying to find a non GMO organic food is a, like a treasure hunt it is they you're not the only the one who said that my research supposedly that's very common so which is sad because yeah. you and I were talking like what can we just get back to nature can we just get back to the natural order of things I feel like if I'm raising my own food I know where it comes from I know I did pesticide it I know it's all organic I know that I can can it that's the other side of things too guys you can can your food you can freeze your food you can you know, store it throughout the winter months so that you've got mm -hmm. food throughout the winter for yourself. So these are all things that we're going to capitalize on in other topics. I was uh, going to say that's a whole <laughs> podcast right there. Um, Cause you know, like canning might seem intimidating to others, but like for instance, it, it's uh, scary I was to me and I, you know, I used to help my grandma can, but one of the thing is that she did it. I didn't do it. The most I did was help her put the tops on, you know, she just wouldn't let you have your hand in that. So I've actually done a little bit myself. It's actually not as hard as somebody might be like, Oh my gosh, does it take some time? A little bit. Yeah. But once you get kind of going in it, uh, but again, if she you're not into canning, you know, beans and say, crack those while I, you know, she's like, or whole the peas, you know. So again, the family's involved. Beans, like, I have was, to hus the, uh, hus the corn, you know, yeah. shuck the corn, you know, so. Yeah. But that's cool. Like, that's a memory. That's, you're building family, you're building Absolutely. experiences, you're building memories, like those types of things. And that's kind of the big thing that we're getting on. Well, it's funny also, you, you say know, that because I had to shut corn at Schnucks the other day. Some, a farmer brought in a big load of corn uh -huh. and they have a place where you can shuck it yourself. So yes. I was shucking corn and I come home and Joel was like, what took so long? I said, well, I had to shuck the corn. He's like, what, what grandma? <laughs> so I had to grab a video and then show him shucking corn. So I know it's kind of like the old rotary phones. Like, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> right. So I do want to kind of say this and hopefully this will help ease people's pain idea of growing things but one of the things that i was even kind of going through my own website on tower gardens i was like i feel like i need to mention this a little bit because tower gardens is kind of big on the idea and this is i'm not even just pushing tower gardens this is with anything guys this is with just pushing seeds into some dirt you know and just kind of like sitting there waiting to watch it happen mm -hmm. if you guys want a quick growth plant some be pants plant some green beans oh my mm -hmm. god those things take off like nobody's business. So you'll come out one day, there's nothing. And then the next day they'll be this long. Not, I'm not kidding, but, um, sunlight is outside guys. Um, water. And if you have a little mini garden, maybe 30 minutes a week, and this is even with your tower gardens, it doesn't need a lot of attention guys. It doesn't mean you're like having to put hours into this, um, with the tower garden specifically, or even a container garden, three square feet. If you want to do bare minimum or just give it a go, right? Um, you don't need to have gardening experience. You don't need to read a bunch of books. You just need to like do it. Sunlight, good soil, seeds, or pre plant, you know, pre sprouted things they can just get started with. Um, and, and obviously watering it. Some things you can keep inside, some things you can keep outside, just kind of depends, but mess around with a little bit and um, have fun with it. I think that that's kind of the biggest thing. Um, you that's know, and really what we want everyone to do. We want everyone mm -hmm. to just get out and have some fun with this. Um, mm -hmm. you know, start your own little garden and move forward from there. If you grow into something bigger than that, that's awesome. You know, um, we're asking that everybody just understand to put the control back into your hands. Correct. And that's the whole purpose for this podcast. Right. Yeah. Just put this control back into your hands, start growing your own little garden. If you find out that you're very interested in moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in some direction, we, you know, permission granted be you move forward. That's awesome. You know, right. We'd love yeah. to hear about it too. We'd like to know if we've inspired that in you. So please make sure you comment and let us know that. Yeah. And I think in the future, we'll probably be doing more podcasts that get a little more specific as far as to help you if you are interested in doing something like that, because, oh. you know, our podcast is all about nutrition and good health. And that's part of it is right. just having good nutritional food and how, you know, food is medicine. Um, and that's kind of the other reason why I think Michelle and I hit on this topic was food is very healing physically and also like when you grow it mentally or like you know 
those types, like it's just good overall health. And, um, and again, we can go on and on in different directions with this topic. But I think the first thing is just basically to say, go have fun. It could be in your backyard. It could be on your balcony. It could be locally in a local, it could just be you participating in dining in a farm to table um, restaurant, you know, go have fun at your farmer's markets. That's kind of a good outing. You're outside, you're, you're finding foods that are grown locally. And obviously there's other vendors. Overall, it's just a great experience. And so I just encourage you guys. Staying local, you know, mm -hmm. again, supporting that local farmer who is maybe not with the government, you know, and getting, you know, food in that direction. So just yes. you to provide, you know, food to your table. Mm -hmm. And again, look at some of these things that the links that we have below, because I think you'd be really fascinated about how farmers are really, they are trying to change things. Um, they are. You no. Know, and I think that just even tapping into it just a tad, you'll be in wonder of how, um, how these things work. Even if you just literally do a quick Google search, you'd be amazed what pops up. So like regenerative farming, soil, um, and just the farming industry in general, I have a lot of appreciation for them. They don't get the appreciation that they deserve. I feel like, I feel like they've kind of been put on the back burner, um, as far as being up in the, you know, being up in the forefront. And I'm very grateful for what the work that they do to provide food to me. So, oh, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So anyway, I think that, I mean, we did cover a lot. Again, this is kind of a broadband type of um, podcast, but I think it was important to kind of touch base on going from the personal side of gardening and how big gardening, big farm, big, I was going to say big pharma. Big farm, right? <laughs> Let's think. Big farming industry. No, we, we just wanted um, to, you know, touch base on on the on the facts of gardening and why mm -hmm. to garden. You know, uh, as you see, we gave you several different topics throughout this podcast, and we just hope that you know one of them resonates with you uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of which we want you to let us know that. Um, and Dean and I talked about this that we definitely, you know, will pick some more topics and um, we will go a little deeper into those topics for you. So if you have a specific mm -hmm. interest, reach out and let us know. Um, Absolutely. We can definitely, you know, put that into play and uh, give you a podcast on that. So give you what we know. Um, I love it. So are we ready to wrap this up and call it, a, ready. call it a day? All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us here at Two Peas in a Pod. Uh, Dina and I are excited to have everybody here with us. So uh, if you'll just do us a huge favor, hit that subscribe button. We would love that. Um, and share us. Share us with anyone that you know could utilize our information because we mm -hmm. would love to be shared out there. So Dina, thank you so much for mm -hmm. being with me today. I appreciate you in so many ways. And you as well. That's a wrap. Have a great day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Be safe and be well. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.